For more, let's welcome in Kira K. Dixon from PGA National. Kira, there was a policy board meeting yesterday on site at the Cognizant Classic. What was your takeaway from the meeting? Yeah, George, as Eamon just mentioned, Florida certainly means that the politics of the PGA Tour are coming more to the forefront. So yesterday, the PGA Tour's policy board met on site here at PGA National from about 1 to about 7.45 in the evening. Now, Jay Monahan did meet with Yasser al Rumayan, the governor of the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, a few weeks ago. But there was no Saudi presence or PIF investment or PIF uh, presence in yesterday's meeting. Now, in terms of the content, they discussed plenty of the continued unanswered questions that we often hear about. Uh, uh, the player that I spoke to that was in the meeting, a member of the PGA Tour Policy Board, said that it is a great time to be a professional golfer in, in the climate that we have today, uh, but especially for those at the highest levels of the game and their priorities continue to be to get the best players together as often as possible. And another priority is trying to alleviate the constant drama and distraction that comes with the conversations that we've been having about the public investment fund and live golf and the fact that that very much affects the PGA Tours product day in and day out and the product that the fan then consumes. Um, in terms of timing, they're looking at hopefully having a resolution by the end of the year. Uh, but there's plenty of division, George, that still remains when it comes to the subject of what to do with Live Golf. All righty, Kira. So definitely that important kernel there in Kira's report. They're saying timing potentially at the end of the year. We're going to dive into this in just a second, Amon. Let's welcome in GolfChannel.com <laughs> senior writer Rex Hoggard. Rex. What's your reaction to what came out of yesterday's meeting? I think we've started to hear this over the last few weeks. I mean, I think there was a level of optimism from people inside the PGA Tour and the DP World Tour that maybe a deal with the Public Investment Fund could get completed by the time they get to the Masters. I think when Keith Pelley announced that he was stepping down, he actually voiced the idea that he'd like to see something done before they got to the Masters. And when he was going to step down as CEO of the DP World Tour, that seems undoable right now. And I think you get a glimpse. I think everyone, including the policy board after yesterday's marathon meeting, is getting an idea of how complicated this is going to be. And when I talk to people who have been involved with similar multi-billion dollar deals, they point out that, look, there's a lot of complexities and a lot of nuances when it comes to these types of deals. But what is going to make this one even more difficult is you're starting to deal with competing interest and competing motivations here. I think we just talked about this yesterday. The idea that John Rahm told ESPN that he hasn't talk, spoken with Tiger Woods since he joined Live Golf. And part of the component, if there is going to be a deal between the Public Investment Fund and the PGA Tour, is going to be welcoming those players back who joined Live Golf into the PGA Tour. And that's a really good indication that that's not on the horizon anytime soon. Rex, when you hear the timeline being the end of the year and when the deal was kind of first announced June 6th of last year, I had people telling me uh, summer of 24, end of 24 is more realistic than the end of 23. Do you, do you view this updated timeline in any way as a setback or is it more indicative of the complexities and the multiple stakeholders involved to try and get this deal uh, to come to fruition? I think your friends are absolutely right. This is all about being realistic about what you can do in that time frame. I was told by people internally at the PGA Tour that when they first announced the framework agreement and came up with that December 31st deadline, that was really just to get everyone marching in the same direction. They said it was just they didn't have realistic expectations that they would have some sort of completed deal by then, but they wanted to make sure everyone was sort of driving towards the same goal. I think you're right. The end of this year is probably a much better scenario because you can work out all of these details. And as I just pointed out, bringing the live players back. How are you going to create whatever PGA Tour Enterprises is going to be? How are the players who left, uh, who stayed loyal to the PGA Tour going to be compensated? I think all of these things need time to work out. He is GolfChannel.com senior writer Rex Hoggard. Eamon, let's open the floor now uh, to you. You've heard what Kira and Rex had to share. If you take a 10,000-foot view at where things stand right now, what's your take? I don't think there's any surprises in the timeline being adjusted here as well. And Rex and Kira are right in terms of the gnarly, more personal issues, I suppose, the more granular issues in terms of how players come back, what does it look like on the ground. The people I've talked to in the last few weeks suggest that the, the stumbling block and the time-consuming part of this 
is who makes decisions, who is authorised and empowered to make decisions on the PIF side of things in terms of those gnarly questions. And I don't believe, based on those conversations, that that person has been yet identified. I don't think anyone believes the financials are going to be a huge problem in this because in a lot of ways the financials have already been done. It's very close to a mirror image in some ways of the deal that we saw with the strategic sports group. Uh, that includes a lot of the Fenway guys from Boston. I do think there are complicated issues here, even outside of golf, that are going to be potentially problematic. You're talking about a regulatory scrutiny from the government. You're talking about all of these situations that the PGA Tour has no control over. I mean, the Public Investment Fund is currently ignoring subpoenas from congressional inquiries in other areas, threatening to jail its own advisors in America who worked for them if they do comply with those subpoenas. The conflict in the Middle East, there are any number of things that could delay and rattle this process. So I, I do think you're looking at probably well into 2025 before you actually start to get a vision of what this solution would look like in the ground, much less seeing it in the ground. Uh, assuming this moves forward on a trajectory where the public investment fund is able to come in with the PGA Tour and SSG Group, at what point could golf fans think, OK, we have a level of stabilization. Now we understand what the future could look like. Is that the multi-billion dollar question <laughs> at this point, George? I, I, it would seem very clear that if you're, if you're talking about being into 25 before there's an agreement reached on the broad strokes, in terms of what a resolved, peaceful golf landscape would look like, you've probably got to realistically be looking at at least 2027 20, by then. So if John Ram left a few months ago thinking that he was going to be back with his pockets full in a few months. I think he's delusional. I think there are going to be parallel tours running for quite some time. So if that's what John Ram left on that basis, then he was sold a bill of goods. There are a lot of thorny issues here, and those thorny issues aren't going to be resolved anytime soon, which is also makes Taylor Gooch's quotes to Australian Golf Digest quite interesting that we saw come out this morning as well. And this is what Taylor Gooch had to say, he said, if Rory McIlroy goes and completes his career Grand Slam without some of the best players in the world, there's just going to be an asterisk. It's just reality. I think everyone, everybody wins whenever the majors figure out a way to get the best players in the world there. And it's, it's interesting coming from Taylor, George, in the sense that Taylor wasn't eligible for the US Open last summer. He declined to enter qualifying to, to make his way into the field. So I guess having taken a handout from the Saudis, he wanted one from the USGA as well, but there is no, no one who qualifies as a best player in the world who is not in the field at Augusta National this month. What Taylor Gooch really means is that Taylor Gooch isn't in the field. And frankly, there isn't a single event on the planet that is diminished by the absence of Taylor Gooch, except possibly the member guest at his home course. How can you say there isn't a single event for either Taylor Gooch or some of the, quote, top live talent, where if you look at other ranking metrics out there aside from the official world golf rankings have them playing among call it top 50 top 60. Yeah you look world. at those they're all in the field at Augusta National there is you if you go down even the data golf rankings that Greg Norman likes to throw around as well Bo Hustler is the top guy in that field who would not be eligible for Augusta no one who qualifies as a best player is not in the field at Augusta National. This is just nonsense that, that Taylor is putting out there. And if you're going to use that asterisk argument, OK, well, is every Open champion pre-Arnold Palmer going in 1960 because the best players in the world really didn't qualify or to bother to play the Open at that stage as well? I, I think once you get into this idea that the best players are somehow being excluded, they're not right now. They're, they have eligibility. He's talking specifically the Masters being diminished in April. Uh, if somebody wins and the best players in the world aren't there, the best players are there. I would say there's some credence to his overall messaging where I don't think if you look at not just the Masters but beyond that, PGA Championship, U.S. Open, yeah. the Open, with the current qualification criteria and the diminished numbers of live golfers from 2022 to where we're at now, that, yeah, it's not necessarily the best indication if your goal is to get the best 156 yeah. players or best 90. You're not necessarily fulfilling that obligation, but the majors have their own criteria, so it's not always the goal is to get the best 156 players. You're getting a snapshot of some of the best players along with secondary criteria. But if you look at golf historically, I mean, 
black players weren't allowed at the Masters until 1975. So you could look at some of the exclusionary policies prior to that and say, okay, well, there is a bit of an asterisk because it wasn't opened up to necessarily the best golfers in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s until the mid-70s and going forward. Same with the PGA Tour and their Caucasian-only policy until 1961. You look at it with baseball and Babe Ruth, it's like, well, okay, he only played against white players until Jackie Robinson in 1947. Very different than what we're seeing with live golfers now, but I think anecdotally you, you look at different policies and say, okay, there could be an asterisk, but it's not what the average golfer thinks long-term I would say. No, it's, it's very different to be excluded on, on those bases versus guys who chose to take themselves out of the process 100%. and then want the rules rewritten when they get there. It's not a problem now. At some point, the majors may decide that they need a carve-out for a live order of merit winner. That day is not here just yet.